Welcome to Real Estate Investing Unscripted, a podcast from Fund That Flip, where we explore some of the most creative, innovative, and inspiring stories from the real estate investor community. With expert tips and success stories you won't hear anywhere else, you'll come away with inspiration on how to improvise in the unscripted world that is real estate investing so that you can dominate your next real estate deal. Now your host, founder and CEO of Fund That Flip, Matt Rodak. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Real Estate Investing Unscripted. I'm your host, Matt Rodak, founder and CEO of Fund That Flip. And today we have a NFL Pro Bowler, first round draft pick, now father of three, active real estate investor, and fortunately for us, a client and friend of the firm, Jason Babin, on the show. Jason is the founder of Red Zone Realty Group based in Jacksonville, Florida. They have four offices in other cities around the country. And in addition to their brokerage business, they are also in the business of buying and renovating homes in a variety of different local markets where they operate. So with that, welcome to the show, Jason. I appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, man, you've got a you've got a one of the more interesting backgrounds, I think, of of any of the guests I've I've had on the show, and I'm I'm sure you have probably stories for days about uh, your NFL days. But I'd love to I'd love to start if you don't mind just by zooming in a little bit on how you went from a long and successful career in the NFL to how and and why you transitioned, uh, you know, from playing ball to to investing in real estate and, and starting a real estate brokerage. Uh, really, it started a long time ago. Uh, my father, uh, he owned his own electrical uh, company. And then as that grew, he kind of uh, started to diversify into some projects and other investments. And, uh, you know, he was he was old school. Um, you know, he made me learn the trades, all, di all different trades. I mean, from electrical to framing to concrete to HVHC. I mean, you name it, I had to do all of it growing up as a kid. And it was just, you know, it's, when you grow up in the Midwest, you know, you, you work. Yeah. You know, either it was either go to sports, go training, or you go to work. It was just uh, just how we did things. And um, obviously, I got into football. Was, it was tied up with football as I got into college and, and the pros for a long time. But I would say about midway through my, my career, I, you know, I started to um, start to pay attention a little bit. And I think the, the catalyst that, that really opened my eyes was the, the 2008 situation, right? Uh, I was a first round draft pick. I put my all my money in the stock market. You know, I thought I was doing the responsible thing, doing the right thing. And after that downturn, I was like, "Hey, where's you know, there's thirty percent of my money. <laughs> what's my money's missing? You know, right. I, didn't, I didn't make any stupid choices. And uh, it really was like a you know shot over the bow, kind of wake up call. And that's when I started paying attention to, you know, my investments. You know, being diversified, making my own decisions. You know, and realizing that hey, these guys work for me. I don't you know they don't have to listen to them. I have to take their advisement. You know. Obviously, the professionals, but you know, I wanted I wanted to start having more control over my life. You know, if you're going to lose my money, I'd rather me lose it than you lose it. Yeah. So I, we start started, you know, doing some speculative real estate stuff, building some spec homes, buying properties, renovating, and uh, you know, so it started it started relatively small, and then uh, by 2010, we really sort of ramped things up in the construction side. You know, personally buying properties, renovating, and and renting them out, and then when once I retired. I was really able to have the time to put a nice big bow around everything. And, and Red Zone Realty was kind of that, that bow. It kind of connected everything. You know, you had, I had the property management, residential and commercial. We had the real estate offices. We had you know, the high level, you know, agents, you know, bringing the good deals to us first. You know, we had the construction side. So it really, um, you know, having that time after I retired was, was able to really connect the dots. And um, we've just been working on, uh, on that system procedure making everything scalable and you know it's 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 really honestly for me it's it's just a uh, a passion it's not like okay how much money i gonna make this week you know i'm trying to improve my agents i'm trying to make the systems better we just rolled out a whole new crm you know for all of our offices around the country you know during this downtime like we gotta do something to get better during the during the uh, mm -hmm. shutdown so it's really not a job for me it's just a, it's just a labor of love Got it. So you, you started investing then when you were still still playing. Yeah. And I had some really good people around me. The gentleman that uh, I'm partners with on the construction side, he uh, he was the gentleman that bought my dad's electrical company and we you know, grew up together, knew each other well. So he was kind of like the sweat equity, you know, runs the that division. You know, I mean, so I, I've, I've got an unbelievable team from my real estate coach, you know, to my operations managers, you know, to everybody that runs the different divisions. I mean, it's kind of like, 
everyone's been in it since the beginning and we've just been organically growing and uh, everyone's enjoyed the fruits of the labors. Got it. That's great. So you're, you're based in Jacksonville, right? That's where you, you reside. Yeah. I'm on the road a lot though. I mean, I don't, um, I don't just call and say, how are things going? You know, yeah. Michigan once a week I, I had it before all this happened. I had, a, I had a very tight schedule. You know, I was in Michigan, I was in Jersey, I was in Houston. So we, um, I, I had a lot of involvement. Sure. Sure. So, so talk to me about those other markets. Obviously it sounds like you're from Michigan, live in Jacksonville. Why Houston? Why New Jersey? Kind of what's the, what's the play there? Well, uh, it, it really goes back to my NFL career. Uh, yeah. I spent a lot of time in Houston. That's where I was drafted originally, lived there a long time. I was with the Eagles for a long time. So it's the Philly Jersey market. So I was able to um, have some really nice relationships, you know, with a lot of professional teams. We have clients at a lot of the different um, states, you know, a lot of different professional sports, from baseball, basketball, soccer, you know, men's, women's, you know. Um, and obviously the teams, especially the people in charge of front office, they, they know that they have trust in us that are going to, we're going to put the, the players in the best decision, you know, because we can say, hey, this person, you know, best case, they may be here for a couple of years. So we're not going to put them in a house that they're not going to be able to sell. Or some of the young players are like, hey, man, just just stay in one of our furnished rentals. Focus on your sport. Focus on your season. We'll, we'll circle back when season's over with. You know, so we, we keep the best interest of the players in mind. So it, and plus we were former players, um, a lot of myself and some of our, you know, agents. So it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those things where there's a lot of trust involved in that situation. But yeah, makes sense. That's cool. So you've leveraged, you've been able to leverage the network you built during your playing days and playing in a couple of different cities into, into, uh, chapter leveraging, two, if you leveraging will. Leveraging is key in, in yeah. uh, real estate, you know, <laughs> as, as you guys know. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, so you're mentioning a little bit before we started the show, how you've brought, you know, a lot of what you learned from, from football and sports into the business. I'd love to, love to hear a little bit more about what, what that means, um, to you guys and kind of, you know, some of those principles maybe that you've brought. Uh, from your playing days into into your business? Well, when, when I first, you know, started the the concept of red zone, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know, you know, and it's a lot of doing things the wrong way <laughs> to figure out the right way. Mm-hmm. But what we realized early on was there, there, there's a very strong uh, similarity between, you know, when you have a winning team, you know, a team that consistently wins, there's, there's a couple of factors that are, are the same. You, you have a group of guys or girls collectively have the same goal, working, you know, in unison, in a selfless way. They're learning based. You know, there are these intangible qualities that make your team, like, win championships, right? Because when you do that as a team, collectively, individually, everyone gets rewarded. Yep. So I wanted to create the, that same kind of culture within the office, right? And we, we put together a profile of agents that fit that mold, right? And a lot like, for example, the Patriots, right? I don't know if you're a football fan or your listeners are, but the Patriots, they have a very high standard of a certain way you have to act, a certain way you have to be. And if you don't, it doesn't matter who you are. And they've proven that time and time again, you're out of here. You know, I remember talking to Randy Moss about the situation when he went to the Patriots. Him and I were teammates in, in Tennessee. And he said he knew that he had to be a certain way yep. why he was there under Bill. And it worked. He had, I think he had his best season ever, you know, from stat wise, but he was a team player doing things from, from, you know, the Patriot way. So I really tried to model our, our culture and, and be very, very strict on who we let in. And it, it takes care of itself. That culture, when someone comes into like on Thursdays, we have our training, there's about 50 people there for our, our Thursday trainings, you know, pre Corona. But if somebody new came in to get a feel for the office, see if red zone was for them, it was a good way for me to bet them because they would bet themselves. Like, oh man, this is high level. Yeah. This is people pushing themselves. This is people trying to grow, trying to learn, trying to improve. And we would, uh, everyone would know, you know, I get texts from people like, hey, they, they don't fit in or hey, they're great. They're going to love it here. You know, so it, it was just, it weeds people out, honestly. It's what, once, once you have yeah. that culture created, because you know what they say, every company has a culture, <laughs> not every culture is good. <laughs> right. And if you don't take control of it, it kind of manifests itself into whatever it, it feels like Whatever. it needs to demand itself itself into yeah, it. Honestly, I spend the majority of, I would say, a good chunk of my time on a, on a weekly basis, you know, making sure those things, those intangibles are are correct and we have the right people. And, you know, whenever we have our leadership meetings on Fridays, with, which is on Zoom, um, not because of the corona, but because a lot of people in different locations, so it just works out really well. We, mm-hmm. were, we were using the, the face, Facebook portals for a while, but we switched over to Zoom being of the year. And that's that's what we talk about, you know, 
how are we doing on, you know, the culture, the different topics, what we need yeah. to do, how we improve it, you know, how's it, how's it going? So yeah, we obviously make it in a, in a tangible, measurable way. So, you know, we can, we can improve. So ha- have you guys co- codified like the culture, like a value system or another way to kind of like put it yeah. down on paper and like, this is what we, we, we have for? obviously the mission statement, but then we yeah. have the visions, you know, values, beliefs, and then we have that written out. We have it on the wall. We have it where you can see it, you know, yeah. and it's something that on a yearly basis, we have our leadership retreat that we evaluate and we may even redo from time to time every year. Cause every year we have a leadership re- uh, retreat from all the people and all the organizations would come together for a, for a week, uh, you know, well, about four days. And, uh, and we really just, we bring in all kinds of different people to help us become better leaders, in the, you know, in the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then we also obviously review that and see if we should change it or tweak it. And, uh, and then we try to personify it in every way possible. So safe to say you are running a full fledged business, uh, uh, for sure. That's uh, that's super cool. Very cool. Well, and it's like <laughs> when I started this journey a few years ago, I didn't know this is where I was going to end up, Yeah. but I purposely have surrounded myself with people and that, that I, well, I guess when I said my football career was easy in the sense of I emulated people I thought were the best people, right? The best yep. defensive end, the best, how, how do they do it? You know, I remember when I got to be around Patrick Kearney and I'm like, this guy's a pro. He's, doing it. So what I decided to do was I want to do whatever Patrick's doing. I'm going to work yeah. out with him. I'm going to eat when he eats. I'm going to watch tape with him. I'm going to, you know, he's an all pro multiple, multiple, you know, back to back. And and I realized the same thing in business when I retired, I'm going to find people that I want to be like, and I leveraged and we're going back to that word leverage. I leveraged my football persona to be around them. Hey, great. And they, they tell me all the secrets, yeah. <laughs> the football stories. You know, yeah. and I'm like, and they don't look at me as like my competition. I mean, at the time they didn't, you know, but now they're like, oh, well, I guess he is now, <laughs> you know, so in, in everything that, um, that I do, I try and leverage, you know, that to, to find out what do you, what are they doing? What are the winners doing? What are the people yeah. on top of them? Absolutely. It's like the definition of wisdom, I think, right? Is being able to learn from other people's mistakes so you don't have to make the same mistakes or learn from their successes so you can emulate their success. I think that's super smart. Yeah, absolutely. This, it's, uh, it's, it's not, there's no secret method. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's no such thing as a new idea, right? Or, or no, no, no reason to make a mistake someone else has made before you. Yeah, if you can, you can, you can well, avoid it. You know, some mistakes that you do have to make on your own. That's true. You really That's do. True. Yep. Yep. That's very true. So let's get a, let's get a little bit more kind of tactical. So uh, we funded a loan with you guys, uh, man, probably right before a lot of this broke out um, in, in Ponte Verita beach, um, which is just outside of Jacksonville. Talk us through a little bit, you know, on the kind of your, your, your more active investing strategy when you guys get involved in flips. How did you find this property? You know, what's the plan for the rehab? Um, who are you building it for? Who do you think it sells to? Maybe just you know, give the, you know, me and the listeners a, a, a little bit better sense of, you know, how you approach your, your renovation and fix and flip business. Well, this is a non-cookie, a non-cookie cutter one, right? And I usually do about, about one of these a year. And um, these ones are always unique and they're never the same in the sense of how you find them, how you get them done, how you close them. You know, some are short sales, some are foreclosures. A lot of times you drive around, you know, looking at properties, you know, Sunday morning, if you get up early or, you know, go a little Saturday workout, it's like, I would drive through this area. And a lot of times you'll see properties that may not be, you know, that look like they're in distress. You know, that's, that's one, one way. Obviously you see a short sale or you see a foreclosure situation. And there's a lot of hair on it. You know, that scares a lot of people. And this particular one, I think, had three different loans. And I have a really good team, my personal real estate team and, and with our admins. And I like to use a broken record method, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, I want, when I want something, you know, I, I use polite persistence as I like to, like to teach it. We'll call every day. We'll send emails every day. We'll send video messages. But we'll do it in a polite way. But in a point where... You know, I think sometimes the, the first lean or the second lean or the third lean are like, oh my God, just, just make them stop calling us. <laughs> we'll do it. You know yeah. what I mean? And we're, hey, how you doing? Great, great. I just want to follow me again today. How is it going? And we'll just wear them out if we have to, you know? Like once we know like, hey, this is what it's going to take to get it done, fine. We will just keep calling, keep calling, keep bombarding them, you know, just, just to get it done. But we'll do it politely. We're not, you know, we're not going to do mean. And it's almost like overtly nice, you know, like, oh, great speaking with you. They're like, oh, my God, I've had to talk to this person one more time. <laughs> so, or, you know, like I said, whatever method, you know, technique, whatever we have to do to get it done, we'll, we'll get it done. But um, honestly, just driving around looking at them or looking at taxes or, you know, where we have, we have some really good relationships with different title companies and some third party services we use for just, 
constantly pulling data and looking at it like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Let's dive into this more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Cause they're just, they're just tough to find nowadays. It's not, it's not yeah. like it was in 2010, you know, 2009, 11, you know, there was, there was a lot of properties that you could find that fit this bill. They're, just, they're getting tougher and tougher to find. Yeah. So you've built systems, you've got data, you've got a bunch of different ways. Uh, it's a machine, right? It's like the rest of your, yeah. the rest of your business. There's a whole acquisition machine that is. And we, we obviously use have our CRM for our, you know, follow-ups. Like, Hey, this one caught my eye. It might not be ready now, but it could be, you know, yeah. I, I can see it continuing down this path. You know, there's some houses we've identified pre-corona where I'm like, well, six months from now, you know, this, this house could, could, could be that situation. So we just, we have a pipeline, you know, and there's, I mean, you know, short sales are, we'll have some yep. in the pipeline for a year. You know, I, the, the last one I had last year's project, you know, the big one that was similar to this took me to almost two years to get, Yep. but, uh, they just, <laughs> numbers like, fine, game. fine yeah. Jason, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Stop calling me. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So what's the plan on this one? Was it, was it pretty banged up? Is it more of a cosmetic? What are you guys doing to it? So this one was, was actually, um, from, you know, structural standpoint and layout standpoint, it was, it was pretty, pretty spot on. I don't know if you, if you go to our website, I got the before and afters through, uh, to one of our projects that was referred to as the Glen Kernan, similar mm-hmm. layout, similar size, but not much when it comes to moving walls, not much, you know, there's, I mean, it's just a lot of cosmetic stuff. And you know, we're putting in some oversized sliders. We're ripping out the old pool, putting a new pool in, putting pavers, paving, you know, painting outside, new landscaping. But for the most part, you know, besides the master bathroom and master closet and kitchen, it's, it's, it's relatively similar. Just updating, making it modern, yep. making it feel, you know, the way a house should feel, you know, 2020. Yep. Yep. And who do you, who do you guys think you sell this to? And, and maybe even let's talk a little bit about, you know, what's going on now. Do you, do you have any concerns with, you know, buyers on the back end of this? Um, well, Florida's, I, I think, in a, in a really good situation as far as, you know, coming out of, uh, you know, the rebound. I don't know if you guys follow uh, KCM, Keeping Current Matters. Yep. You know, one of the things they posted today was um, about the, uh, the V recovery. You know, like it's not going to be like it was post-2008. You know, this recovery is going to have, have uh, you know, it's, it's going to come out of the hole quickly. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's not just them. That's Goldman Sachs. That's all the other, you know, um, big firms that predict the same thing. Um, plus, this is in an area, a neighborhood where the price point um, is very high. And there is also a lot of retired, you know, professional athletes from golf to football to, you know, baseball, basketball. And obviously those clientele are in our, in our wheelhouse. Um, but also there's a lot of, um, you know, doctors, international people. So it, um, there's a, there's a good variety of, of clientele yep. at price point. So it's not by any means the highest by, you know, by any means the lowest it's right, right in the middle. It's an, it's a good, good sweet spot. Yep. Should, should sell well for the, uh, and honestly, all these higher end ones that we do. And, and the thing about most neighborhoods, especially in, in, I would say in the Northeast Florida area, they're highly desirable, right? As far as there's certain gated communities you want to live in. You know, there's, there's, there's Sawgrass TPC where they have the golf tournament. There's uh, Marsh Landing where this one's at. You know, there's Glen Kern and there that are, you know, exclusive, high-end, high, you know, nice houses, big lots, all that stuff. The problem was, or, you know, the, the issue is they're built 30 years ago, some mm-hmm. of these houses, 20 years ago. And they have that, that dated look to them. And people yep. want to move into these houses, they have the money to buy them. They're like, oh my God, this house is so ugly. You know, it's just so dated. It's not a bad house. It's just, it's, it's a, and a lot of people have a hard time imagining, what does this thing look like Are we done? You know, they can't see right. it. You know, someone like you and I are in, in this industry, like, oh, this house has got good bones. You're like, oh, I don't see it. Right, I mean, right, there's, right. there's even times where my wife goes, what did you buy today? <laughs> you know? Trust me, and it's going to be all right. Like, okay, okay, yeah. I see it now. And uh, I, I, enjoy, I absolutely enjoy that process. If I could do this full time, you know, I would, I would do it full time. Um, it's, it's just a fun thing to do to take this old property and turn it into something brand new. And, and someone buys it like, this is my dream home. You know, yep. Yep. you can just, you can just check every box from the hardware to the tile, to the flooring, to the way you reshape the doors, to the color, you know, just the way everything moves together and almost recreate this house. Like this is how the house should have been. Um, it just, it's just a really good, you know, fulfilling feeling. It's one of those things where you can actually like get your hands on and see the difference. Whereas like, I would imagine not that you can't see the difference in your other business, but it's a lot of like stuff, right? That you know, you're doing and being productive, but like at the end of the day, you're kind of like, what did I, what did I do today? <laughs> and uh, I have that feeling anyways. The, uh, the social media aspect from the before and afters for the, yeah. you know, the projects, they all, you know, the, um, 
the social media that we uh, management team we use to do all all of my different companies. This one gets the most interaction, the most likes, the most shares because it's you know like you know people don't believe it. This is before and after. Come on. Yeah, we we call it we call it house porn. Um, <laughs> exactly. People love it. Yeah. You know they love it. <laughs> And then all, all the all the all the agents, you know, they're like, "Can we can we do can we do a brokers open? Can we have an event there?" You know, and of course, I don't, you know, I, I let everybody use it. They want to use it. Yeah, yeah you know, get more people in. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of people want to know, you know, that that are investors on our platform, right? Deploying capital and in, into loans like yours after we've originated them are, are curious to know, like, what's happening with construction in some of these states? Are projects still progressing? And it's obviously a state by state kind of a, a thing, but. What's going on? What's going on down in Florida right now? And I like to put a date on this. It's April 21st. Are you guys still working? Project still progressing? I think um, oh, things are just absolutely ripping right now in Florida from a con- new construction standpoint. Just keep in mind, on a, on a national level, before this virus hit, you know, and everything, everybody kind of got a little nervous. Um, building permits were up 9.9 percent, you mm-hmm. know, year to date from last year to this following year, going into the first quarter. And they and obviously inventory, as you know, is extremely low. I mean, we were having inventory issues at our offices before this happened because yep. it, was, it was a very strange time when you had low inventory, you had low interest rates, and you had it like a seller's a seller's market. Like those three things just don't ever align. I don't I don't think in my adult life I've ever saw those things align. So it was it was a very strange time because and we really felt since the interest rates are so low, everyone was refining. Like on the more our mortgage arm uh, side of the company, we have a mortgage company as well. It was so many refis, right? Yeah. People were like, well, I'm just refining. I'm not buying new. And everyone kind of kind of predicted, okay, once the interest rates start to tick back up, people are like, okay, maybe I won't refi, maybe I'm gonna sell. I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna get it locked in before before the interest rates keep climbing up. You know, they wanna lock it in, obviously for long term, you know, you know, reasons. So there was this pent up demand going into Corona. And usually, you know, that those months, those those March, April, May, June, those are the, those are the big months. Cause that's when people move the kids are out of school. So it's, it's going to be very interesting. And, and I, I think I'm not the only one that feels this way. We're going to have a very bullish fall. I think and it's going to go into winter. Yeah. Because I think people are going to make decisions about their life. I mean, this, this gave me a lot of people some time to reflect, to think what's important, you know, yep. how can I manage my time? What do I really want in life? What kind of house do I want? You know, I mean, you see the traffic online. So I think, once things can really start opening up and getting back, um, not just in some of the other states that weren't as affected as heavily, but some of the other states as well, I think it's going to be it's going to be a wild ride all the way into Christmas. So you think you think a lot of this um, pent up demand that's being created because we're on lockdown? Do you think that comes back to market we as soon as it in. can? Oh yeah, yeah, it hasn't gone away. I mean, yeah. honestly. I would say 600, and I, uh, I would over the last four weeks here in Jacksonville and Orlando, our offices in Florida, all of the uh, offers, I would say under, you know, 550, 600, all of almost all of them have been multiple offer situations. All the higher end stuff has been pulled. I think we've only had a few deals, you know, uh, over over a million, you know, get, get signed during this time. And some, you know, listings just get, you know, kind of paused or pulled that were over a million. But things in that 350, 450, I mean, they're fighting over them just because yeah. there's still no demand. People still have to move, still have to, still have to do, you know, sell their house, buy a house. So once that consumer's confidence gets up and everyone can go back to work and some, some of these issues get, you know, ironed out, it, uh, we're going to get right back on track. I think that's right. I think uh, people make home buying decisions on much larger forces than, uh, one thing, right? They're getting married, they're having kids, they're moving, whatever it is, those things are going to continue to happen. Um, as long as they can get back to work quickly, I think it uh, all comes back pretty quickly. Absolutely. All right, cool. So uh, we'll get you out of here on this last question. So the theme of the show is, is real estate investing unscripted. We all know that no matter how much we plan or run the numbers, right? There's always going to be uh, something we run into that's somewhat unexpected, right? So do you have a good good story you could share with the listeners about whether it's a fix and flip or maybe something else that happened, you know, in one of your businesses that you may, you thought like, man, really, really had this figured out and then you got into it and it was like, oh man, didn't see that one coming. I had one recently on a, a large uh, flip home, you know, in the, in the, the million, I think it's million six home, but million six, five and it went up selling for it. And we had a lot of money into it, right? And there was an issue because the, it kind of had like a, a somewhat of a walkout basement because the way the house was built on this hill and ended up getting it really cheap. 
because of the water intrusion, right? And the, the lower half was all molded. It was gross and there was water coming in. And I'm like, oh, we just figured it was a cracked foundation or, you know, like there was plenty of meat on the bones to figure this out and get it fixed. But for the life of us, we could not get it figured out. <laughs> and we, we put Michigan's in. I have a concrete division in Michigan up there putting basements in. And I'm like, you know, finally, I flew one of my guys that run my concrete division down to Florida from Michigan. I said, listen, come down here, figure this out. We got to figure this out. I, I can't progress. We can't, we can't put, you know, walls up. We can't put two by fours up. We can't put tile down. We can't finish this, this lower half until we figure this out. But we ended up finally after weeks of me just not sleeping. <laughs> yeah. We ended up there. There was this company that drills these tiny little holes in the concrete. Cause we, we carved away the front of the house. We retarded, it, re, you know, rubber, put underground gutters in, drain fields away from the house. I mean, the whole nine and still we're having moisture issues. And they ended up drilling these small holes about every 10 feet and injecting this, uh, this liquid that reacts with water. And it, it turns into foam and seals and expands. And I had them drill them every five feet just to be sure. Just, and just, just foam the you-know-what out of the underneath of the, of the foundation and the front of the foundation. And the guy was like, listen, if, the, if there, this house ever leaks, it's because the house lifted, floated away in a, in a, <laughs> in a Noah's Ark situation. <laughs> so I put so much foam underneath this foundation that sealed up. And, and sure as shit, I mean, I got, I had the hoses out, ran the hoses, let it rain, you know, and just sealed it up. But it was one of those, it was like a three week stretch there where I was just racking my brain going, man, did I, did I really just screw this whole deal? <laughs> so what <laughs> was it? Just, this just, one? just water seeping in underneath? So what, what they did, yeah, they, when they did this kind of half, uh, kind of a half basement thing, when they poured everything, they kind of poured the, the wall on top of the foundation and so, instead of pouring it like one solid piece with like a footer. Uh, and so it was just kind of, you know, I don't think people in Florida maybe probably don't do too many basement things. They just, they just kind of built it wrong. So, but we yeah. thought, you know, I thought, Oh, we can fix this. But then I was like, Oh crap, maybe we can't fix this. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a, there was a stressful three weeks of my life where I was, uh, you know, felt so, like I almost, almost lost it. So, so that goes one of two ways, right? Are you either like, I'm never buying a house with one of these basements in Florida again, or I'm going to look for these because now I know how to fix them and I can probably get a good buy on it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I got a heck of a buy. I mean, that, that house was, yeah. I paid, you know, I think 400 grand for a 7,000 square foot house. So, but it had that issue that no one could figure out. So I was like, well, I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I'm glad you figured it out. So I'm curious. You mentioned a couple of different businesses. This is my last question. So you've got the real estate brokerage business. You got the investing business. You got a concrete pouring business. You got a mortgage business. How many? How many businesses are? And are they all kind of under the the same brand? Or yeah, they're all not. They all their own individual brand. Okay. But I wanted to have you know a place where you could we could handle everything. You know, my original background is construction, and I dressed it up with the real estate. Uh, but then I was like, listen, I want to have mortgage too. I want to have in-house ability to do mortgage, but it's, it's, it's its own brand and it functions as its own identity. But we do a lot of things together from a leadership, from a culture standpoint, but it's, it's its own brand, yeah. its own logo, its own name. But I want to have the ability to say, hey, we open up a new office. Well, we can drop our property management in. We can drop our uh, mortgage in. We can drop whatever it is into that office and it, it's scalable, it's functional because we're in the process of uh, franchising our real estate office. Okay. Um, and we're, we're working with a lot of uh, former athletes because, as you know, former athletes, some of them don't have a, you know, for lack of better terms, a discern discernible skill set. You know, they're they're charismatic, they're smart, they work hard. You know, they you know can talk to people, they can convey their messagery. You know, and you know, getting all this weird sport, whether whatever it is, like, okay, now what do I do? I'm 30 years old. Am I going to take an internship? You know, somewhere <laughs> making minimum wage? You know, well, what am I going to do? You know, as you know, a lot of them end up. Owning a gym, selling insurance, getting to finance, you know, life insurance, all those other topics, real estate. So I wanted to have something, another vehicle for guys, you know, that if they wanted to take things real estate wise to the next level, more than just investing that we could. Because a lot of the deals we do are for, you know, former athletes where we identify properties that need to be renovated or build them properties and then manage them and, and uh, you know, send their money every month. But some of the guys have expressed some interest in taking things to the next level. So we're, we're grooming a handful of guys and, and kind of get them up to speed over this next year to uh, roll out some uh, franchises That's in cool. some other cities. That's really cool. So that was my next question. What's next? Is that, is that the next big play for you guys getting the brand out into more yeah, cities? We, and we've just went through, I mean, I've myself and the operations uh, we've gone through and built this manual um, and went through legal, all the different stuff last almost about the last year. 
Um, and we're just about wrapped up with it. Um, so we're getting ready to roll it out this, uh, this year. Awesome. That's really cool, man. It sounds like you got your fingers in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different pots, but it sounds like you're having a lot of fun with it all. Yeah. Like I said, I have an unbelievable team and it's, it's really, it's really not work for me. Yeah. That's cool. Jason, really appreciate you taking the time. If, if people want to learn more about what you guys are up to, is there a good website to check out or Facebook or Instagram? Where should, yeah, where should I would, people I would check out our website? Just uh, redzonerealtygroup.com. Redzonerealtygroup.com. We got a project that we funded for Jason down in Ponte Verde Beach currently on the website. We'll get it linked to uh, here on the, on, the, on the podcast as well. So you can check that out uh, and see what he's up to uh, on this one. Otherwise, really, really appreciate the time. Super cool to connect with you and learn a little bit more about your story and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to follow the journey. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you all out there for listening to this episode of Real Estate Investing Unscripted. For more great resources or to get funding for your next project, head on over to fundthatflip.com. Otherwise, I look forward to, uh, to next time. Your host, Matt Rodak, signing off. 